Minister Malcolm, when you broke with Elijah Muhammad back in March, you said it was because the black Muslims were too narrowly sectarian and inhibited, and because Elijah Muhammad had become blindly jealous of you and the personal following you had gathered. Mm -hmm. that, I said the first part, but the last part, I didn't say that Elijah Muhammad himself had become blindly jealous. I mentioned that it was his family and the officials in Chicago. Everything that I said always was designed to protect Mr. Muhammad himself primarily because the image that he had created uh, was the image that enabled his followers to remain strong in faith and things of that sort. And I didn't want to see any uh, adverse effect or negative result uh, develop um, in the faith of all of his followers. Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, despite the fact that I tried to protect the Muslim movement, if you'll notice, they uh, used their newspaper to slander me and to labeled me as a hypocrite and uh, as a rebel, and Mr. Muhammad himself said that I defected. Well, in reality, I never even left the Muslim movement. They put me out, and they put me out because of what I knew, and what I knew was told to me by Mr. Muhammad's son, uh, Wallace Muhammad himself. They put me out, and they put him out. Well, now, first of all, let's find out what it is that Wallace Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad's son, told you. Well, uh, number one, if you notice, the, the stick that I always used in presenting, representing, and defending the Muslim movement was the fact that it had the ability, re ability to reform the morals of the so-called Negro community. It eliminated drug addiction, alcoholism, uh, fornication, adultery, loose sex, sexual behavior, which meant that uh, I'd eliminated bastard babies, illegitimate children. Well, as long as I knew that this was what it represented and it gave me a strong stick, I could represent it and defend it. But uh, we had a law which uh, meant, which means, which was that uh, whenever any uh, Muslim became involved in any kind of sexual relationship with someone to whom they weren't married, that person would be brought before the Muslim community humiliated and then isolated for from one to five years. This was our law. Well, uh, in 1954, a teenage sister left Detroit and became one of Mr. Muhammad's personal secretaries. And uh, there in the Chicago office, she became pregnant after being there for a year. And uh, she was brought before the Muslim community and humiliated and isolated. And uh, a, year, a year later, another secretary, this time one from uh, Lansing, Michigan, uh, came to Chicago. She also became pregnant. She was brought before the community and humiliated and isolated. And because the other person was never brought forth during this uh, court session, it was uh, concluded by all of Mr. Muhammad's followers that it was a non-Muslim who was the other party. Well, we grew so rapidly that in 1957 or 58, the uh, secretarial staff was expanded to, I think, 18 eight sisters. In 1959, six of them disappeared. Two of them reappeared in Philadelphia about two or three months later, and they were all right. Uh, the other four reappeared in 1960. All four of them had babies. All four of them had uh, become involved with someone and become pregnant and had these children. So it was, uh, from what I now know, when the four of them got back to Chicago and began to compare notes, they found that the same man had told all of them the same story and had made all of them pregnant, that the same man was the father of all four of their children and had also been the father of the ch children brought forth by the two secretaries who preceded them. Mm -hmm. So this story was kept among these sisters until 1962. Two of them rebelled uh, against uh, the person who was responsible and began to tell the story all over the city of Chicago. It caused many of the Muslims in the Chicago mosque to leave and go back out in the street. They knew it, and uh, it, I knew nothing about it until 1963 when um, Mr. Muhammad's son, who had been in prison, uh, came out, and he, was a, he had been a minister. He was very religious and spiritual, and when he began to hear these rumors around Chicago, he went to one of the sisters, and the sister admitted to him that the rumor was true, and uh, it was he who first told me about it. And when he told me about it, I, took, I wrote to Mr. Muhammad and told him about it, and he admitted that he had a knowledge of it, and that uh, he'd given me a religious explanation that would fit into prophecy and all of that, so I was quiet. And it wasn't until October of uh, 1963 that it came up again. And when it came up again, I realized that the same person who had uh, made these other sisters pregnant was still busy doing the same thing. He hadn't stopped. 
two of the sisters had two children by the same man. And one of, the two, one of those two sisters was pregnant still, getting ready to have a third child by the same man. So when it was known uh, among the Chicago officials that I had a knowledge of this, they become very fearful of me. They became very antagonistic toward me, and they, they, had, they had to do something to diminish the authority that I had for fear that if this became public knowledge, the followers would leave the Muslim movement and follow me. And it was at that time that they used the statement that I made against President Kennedy as a pretext to cut my authority, and uh, some other things happened that finally uh, produced the split or forced the split. And when I made the split, the only reason that I didn't make this public knowledge was I knew the implications, and I, I felt that if the uh, Muslims who were in the uh, Nation of Islam knew it, that which enabled them to be so strongly religious and uh, exercise moral discipline would be shattered, and it would cause all of them to go right back and start doing the things that they had been doing previously. Who is the father of all of these various children whom you have enumerated? Uh, the first one to tell me who the father was was Wallace Muhammad, and he told me that the father was Elijah Muhammad himself. One of the sisters, uh, he went to the home of one of the sisters, and when he walked in the door, she says, I want to let you see something. And she uh, showed him her child. She said, here's your brother, and your father is the one, your father is the father of this child. And then I questioned the sisters myself, because it, I was shook up. And they admitted to me that Elijah Muhammad was the father of their children. And I took it to him. And it was at that time he told me that he was Muhammad, the prophet, and that Muhammad had nine wives. He also told me that he was David. He was the modern David, and that he, that he was the modern Solomon, and that he, he was meant, it was meant for him to fulfill today all of the things that they did back there. And how many of these illegitimate children did he father with the sisters? Well, he made uh, six sisters pregnant. They all had children. Two of those six had two children. Uh, uh, one of those two is having a child right now. I am told that there is a seventh sister who is supposed to be in Mexico right now, and she's supposed to be having a child by him. For one thing, when you first separate from your wife, it's a physical separation, but it's not psychological. You still have feelings for her, and you protect her. Uh, but after the physical separation has taken place for a while, it becomes a psychological separation. It was the same way with me and the Muslim movement. When I first separated, it was a physical separation, but my feeling was still there. And it was only after my trip uh, into the Muslim world and, and my pilgrimage to Mecca that I really was able to uh, exercise the objective approach to it that enabled me to see that something had to be done to bring this to light. Otherwise, a whole lot of innocent people would be killed needlessly. Well, these revelations that you are now making about Elijah Muhammad, what effect should they have on his following? Well, I very much doubt that any of his followers who really uh, are aware of what he has done would continue to follow him. Uh, he may try and justify it by saying that he's a Muslim, a Muslim, and that a Muslim has a right to these wives. If this were the case, he, these sisters should not have been humiliated. These sisters have been looked upon for the past uh, five years, or six years, or seven years, as uh, being guilty of having committed uh, fornication. They have been debased. They have been degraded. I have heard he. I have heard him himself refer to them as having disgraced him. So, if they were his wives, he should have given them a position of respect, so that all of his followers would re respect them, and that they would have his have the protection of his followers today. Well, do you feel that you then, perhaps now, should take over the leadership of the black Muslims? No, I have no desire to take over the leadership of the black Muslims, and I have never had that desire. But I do have this desire. I have a desire to see the Afro-American in this country get the human rights that are his due. I believe that the Islam religion is the best religion for our people because it creates unity and it cre gives one uh, uh, dignity and, and uh, racial confidence and all of these things that are necessary to make a complete human being. Are you not perhaps afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh, yes. I probably am a dead man already. What but, do you mean? Uh, well, uh, when, you know, when you understand the makeup of the Muslim movement and the psychology of the Muslim movement, as long as uh, any, if I, I myself, in, by having confidence in the leader of the Muslim movement, if someone came to me and I had no knowledge whatsoever of what had taken place and they told me what I'm saying, I would kill them myself. The only thing that would prevent me from killing someone who made a statement like this, they would have to be able to let me know that it's true. 
Now, if anyone had come to me other than Mr. Muhammad's son, I never would have believed it even enough to look into it. But I had been around him so closely, I had seen indications of, its, of, its, uh, of the reality of it, but my religious sincerity made me block it out of my mind. Have you received threats on your life? Oh, yes. Uh, I first received threats on my life in December. Uh, rather, no, yes, in December. No, not in December, in January. When, I, uh, when it first became known, that I had uh, came back to come back to New York and told the captain of the fruit in New York, who was my right-hand man formerly, and also the secretary of the New York mosque and the minister in Boston. When it became known that I had told them, uh, then uh, an effort was made to shut me up. One brother uh, encouraged to go out to my house and shut me up. And uh, it, fortunately, it was a brother who was well capable of doing so but it was a brother who was highly uh, intelligent. He was academically equipped to think for himself. And what he was told to do didn't add up. And fortunately, he was the one who put out a feeler to me to find out what was wrong. And I opened his eyes. And then he opened the eyes of the same crew whose job it is to do this kind of work. You mean he was going to kill you? Oh, yes. Uh, one of them was, uh, an attempt was made to get one of them to wire my car with an explosive. That one is with me right now. Well, well, fortunately, right. while I was among the Muslims, I, I never uh, lived beyond my means, and I have learned how to live within means. And I still have the clothes that, I, uh, that was provided for me at that time. I'm in the house that was provided for me, although we're in a court battle. They're trying to get it back. And I have made this statement to them concerning the house that they could have it. If they would take me back, that they would permit me to come before the Muslim movement, the rank and file, and explain or defend myself against all of the charges that they've made against me, they could have the house. But uh, they are going contrary to their own laws by standing up in the mosque and indicting me, but never giving me a chance to defend myself. And they say that no one can judge me but Mr. Muhammad. In this case, Mr. Muhammad can't sit as judge because he's involved in the case. Elijah Muhammad says of the Muslims, we carry no arms and we do not seek to win victory with arms. We do nothing to others that we would not have done unto us. The uh, two brothers were sent after me with revolvers by Joseph, the captain of the fruit in New York. They were armed. When, uh, when a Muslim is attacked, and you'll find this to be the pattern, when the Muslims were attacked in uh, Monroe, uh, Louisiana, uh, Elijah Muhammad gave no signal to anybody across the nation to come to the defense of their brothers. When our brothers were attacked in Los Angeles, again, Elijah Muhammad gave no signal to anybody to come to the defense of those brothers. Never have the Muslims anywhere in the country gotten any kind of instruction from the national office or headquarters on how to defend themselves when they are attacked by outsiders. The only times the Muslims have ever been given any instructions to commit violence is when, is when that violence is directed against a fellow Muslim. His followers are violent against Negroes. Against Negroes? Yes, his, his, his followers will go out and attack another Negro like they will attack me. Or they will, or they will uh, brutalize a fellow Muslim who breaks the law. But you don't find those same followers going out and becoming involved in the Negro struggle in any way whatsoever. Now, the violence that he accuses me of is my uh, uh, tendency to want to participate in the struggle of the Negro at all levels. This is what he calls violence. One question before we go further with that. Has Wallace Muhammad left the black Muslims? Wallace Muhammad was put out of the uh, Muslim movement right along with me. As far as you are concerned, you will accept the fealty, if you will, of any Negro anywhere under any conditions. Uh, you have to uh, de define fealty. Well, you won't want them to give you their loyalty. Not me, their loyalty. I'm not seeking for the loyalty of any Negro. But I am seeking that Negroes, for Negroes to learn how to be loyal to themselves. And when the Negro learns how to be loyal to himself, our problem is pretty well solved. Minister Malcolm, you have suggested that there are all kinds of movements in Harlem growing that you and I don't know about? Oh, yes. Uh, frustration itself has been has been sufficient all that was necessary to make negroes realize the the importance of banding together 
and Negroes are banding together. Banding together in what kind of movements? Uh, different kinds of movements, all kinds of movements, and, and they remain almost invisible. They remain almost unknown, but yet they are there. When I say invisible, I mean invisible in the sense that their existence is unknown, and no matter how much you try and track them down, you can't find them, and never try and find them through the Negro leaders. The Negro leaders are famous as apologists. If you recall, one of the most famous Negro leaders in 1959 was asked by you uh, about the black Muslim movement. And he said he knew nothing about it. And the next moment, you flashed a picture on the screen with him shaking hands with me, So, uh, if you will recall. So this is, what, this is their policy. This is their attitude or their reaction. They never know what's going on in the Negro community. And what form will the activities of these various so-called invisible movements take in Harlem well, this summer? An example, uh, Commissioner Murphy. Almost every statement that Commissioner Murphy makes uh, would give you the impression that he's encouraging the police, rank and file policemen, that, uh, to take whatever method or measure is necessary to hold the Negroes in check. Uh, he feeds the type of statistics to the white public to make them think that Harlem is a complete criminal area that everyone is prone toward violence. This gives the police the uh, impression that they can then go and brutalize the Negroes or suppress the Negroes or even frighten the Negroes. Whenever something happens, 20 police cars converge on one area. This doesn't frighten Negroes. So it means that someone is either misinforming Commissioner Murphy and making him use tactics this year that he would not use four years ago or that the former policeman Kennedy would not use. And, and this uh, force that is so visible in the Harlem community creates a spirit of resentment in every Negro. They think they're living in a police state and they become hostile toward the policeman. They think that the policeman is there to be against them rather than to protect them. And these thoughts, these frustrations, these uh, apprehensions automatically are sufficient to make this, uh, make these Negroes begin to form means and ways to protect themselves in case the police themselves get too far out of line. You have called for self-defense units, rifle clubs, oh, yes. ready to execute on the spot those who threaten Negroes. I don't think that I said that. Yes, you did. No, I don't think I said that. All right. I have called for rifle clubs that I think Negroes should, uh, in areas where the police, whether it be federal, state, or city, have proven their inability or their unwillingness to defend Negroes, the lives and the property of Negroes, then it's only intelligent and it's only right that Negroes protect themselves, and I have encouraged them to buy a rifle and a shotgun, which according to the Constitution is legal. For what? Not, not, not buy a pistol or, an auto or something like that, but a rifle or a shotgun, which is constitutionally le legal. For what purpose? So that at any time, anyone makes any effort whatsoever to brutalize them or attack them or endanger them, they should have something to defend themselves. And in a country that spends, I think, $50 billion a year for defense alone, I'm shocked that uh, any, uh, there's apprehension over Negroes trying to do something to defend themselves. Well, who will determine when the Negro is endangered? I think that if the government is concerned, instead of uh, being so worried about what the Negro is going to do, the government should stop dragging its feet and take the initiative necessary to eliminate the injustices that frustrate Negroes and drive them into a method of uh, defense such as this. You've said, Minister Malcolm, you have to expect the Negroes to rise up sooner or later. Oh, yes. What does that mean? Well, just the same thing that it meant in uh, South Vietnam and these other places where you find oppressed people. Uh, sooner or later, they rise up against the oppressor. When the Jews were being uh, uh, brutalized in Poland, there came a time when they couldn't take it anymore, and they fought back. They didn't have too much to fight with, but they fought back. Uh, and I think every oppressed people, no matter how meek and humble they are, after you drive them so far, they're going to strike back. Well, does that mean that you expect to organize battalions or uh, paramilitary units in various Negro ghettos around the country and establish th this coming summer for violent action? No, but I think that most Afro-Americans, so-called Negroes, have reached the point of no return and are taking it upon themselves to be prepared if the necessity ever arrives where they will have to do something to defend themselves. Well, there was talk a month ago, you remember, of a group in Harlem called the Blood Brothers who left the black Muslims when you did and then later parted company with you 
we are told, because the tactics that you espoused were too mild. What do you know of them, the Blood Brothers? Well, I certainly wouldn't apologize for them. I think that uh, the approach, if, uh, if such a group as Blood Brothers exists... Does it? I say, if, well, I think all Negroes are blood brothers. Every Negro I know is my blood brother. Oh, but, Minister Malcolm, we're talking about a group said to number up to 400, probably more, who confess themselves to be anti-white as you are. They disbelieve in nonviolence as you do. One group among them is said to believe in violence, even in murder, almost for violence' sake. Another group among them are said to believe in violence only for retribution, to strike back. Well, if such a group as the blood brothers exists, it doesn't shock me. I would only be shocked at white people being shocked because the conditions that prevail, uh, Mike Wallace, are such that it's a miracle that such group hasn't formed a long time ago. But do they exist to your knowledge? I think every Negro in Harlem is a blood brother, whether he admits it or not. Where you find dissatisfied Negroes, that's Harlem. And where, if, whereas 20 years ago when you'd have a little race riot, it was confined to a community. Today, Mike, if you have any kind of racial explosion, it will engulf the entire city, and it will have a chain reaction effect of spreading from city to city and on an international scale from country to country. And I, for one, would not like to see it happen, but I am a realist enough and I'm man enough to face the fact that the uh, potential ingredients for this explosion exist, and I will never try and make the public think that it doesn't exist. Well, when you walk through the streets of Harlem, you hear this comment and that comment, and you get the impression that everybody is ready. They have arms? I think Harlem has always been armed. Do you look for violence in yes, Harlem this I summer? Yes, I do look for violence. When you say Harlem, mind you, Harlem is New York City. Queens is Harlem. Uh, Brooklyn is Harlem. The Bronx is Harlem. Westchester is Harlem. I mean, could you not become the leader of this kind of a group? Which kind of a group? A violent group. It's not a case of becoming a leader of a violent group. Uh, I don't think any group, even that's ready, wants violence. It's a case of... Is, is this not, Minister Malcolm, a, uh, a call to action of sorts that you are raising here and now? I don't have to raise a call to action. And this is what I'm trying to make white people see. They, they have lost their ability to be objective where the race problem is concerned primarily because they know that no real meaningful results have come from the Negro struggle. And in defense of this, they always call it or label it violence. You really believe that any meaningful result is going to come from violence? It's not a case of violence. I think that, uh, uh, it's, 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 see, if you could get away from looking at it as violence, then you would be objective and see that actually, actually all it is is a tendency to react to what they are confronting. White people don't realize how frustrated Negroes have become. I think they have become to un that they have come to understand the Negroes' frustration, but they are also of a, the opinion that no good can possibly come from violence. I think they are of that opinion, Mike. If you think that uh, the powder keg that's in your house is going to explode under certain conditions, either you have to remove the powder keg or remove the conditions. You can't stand there and, and label the powder keg as, as an enemy when you have the ability or have it within your power to change the condition, and it won't explode. Do you know of any contingency plan for action? No. I know, I know of none. But I don't think if you go and study the history of uh, oppressed people, usually their initial action is not a plan. Usually it's a reaction, and it's on the part of a few, and then everybody gets right on in with it. And I think you'll find that if, if uh, Negroes ever have to resort to any kind of physical action to defend themselves, many white people will be on the side of Negroes. Many white people are fed up with, the, with what the Negroes suffer. And this is what I had to become aware of on my pilgrimage to Mecca. I could see then that there are many white people in this country who will side with the Negro in whatever he has to do to protect himself. You have changed your attitude about the white man in the United States to some extent. Well, I've broadened my scope. Travel broadens your scope. Uh, gives you a wider understanding. And I have in my many lectures on college campuses seen many whites, even as a black Muslim, whose uh, reaction to much of what I had to say showed me that they were genuinely concerned. Some weren't genuinely, genuinely concerned, but many of them were. And this element is increasing. But that's a considerable change of opinion in Malcolm X. No, today I'm speaking for myself. 
Formerly, I spoke for Elijah Muhammad. And everything I said was, Elijah Muhammad teaches us thus and so. I'm speaking now from what I think, from what I have seen, from what I have analyzed and, and the conclusions that I have reached. And the white man is no longer the devil and he is no longer bound to be evil. The Holy Quran teaches us to uh, judge a man by his conscious behavior, by his intention. And my uh, reason for going to Mecca was to get a better understanding of the religion of Islam and what the Quran teaches. So I judge a man by his conscious behavior. I am not a racist. I don't subscribe to any of the tenets of racism. Then there are good whites and good blacks and bad whites and blacks. It's not a case of being good and bad, good or bad, blacks and whites. It's a case of being good or bad human beings.